Today on Between the Lines, a past guest of our program whose book changed the lives of many viewers, including mine. The best-selling author of The 48 Laws of Power and The Art of Seduction, Robert Greene. I'm Barry Kibrick. With his latest book, The 33 Strategies of War, Robert once again helps us gain mastery in the modern world. His newest book is a comprehensive guide to the subtle social games of everyday life, informed by the most ingenious and effective military principles. Get ready for all the psychological ammo you'll ever need to overcome patterns of failure and forever gain the upper hand in life. Robert, welcome back. As I said in the introduction and as I, t I told you before, the 48 Laws of Power had a major effect on me in a positive way, and I'm so glad to have you here with the 33 Strategies of War. But I have to say something. Even the study of power, mm -hmm. I'll never forget the emails I got. It's a very funny feeling when you talk of power because mm -hmm. people are afraid of power. Some mm -hmm. people want more power. Mm -hmm. When you go into war, though, mm -hmm. I'm already set for the battles and emails, the 33 <laughs> strategies of war. Did you just do this to bug people? <laughs> <laughs> well, not at all. I mean, I know that there's this sort of prejudice, this general thought of war as being something very violent and aggressive, where it's sort of barbaric and people are killing each other. But this is kind of ridiculous, because there's a whole other side to warfare that's just so fascinating. And it's basically the mental, the r rational, the strategic side of war. Um, and essentially, if you study war at all, you understand quite simply that it's the, f the mental part, the strategy, the thinking that goes behind it, that is much, much more important than the physical aspect of actually fighting. And well, that's what fascinates me about it. And in fact, the, the, what fascinated me was even the very beginning when I started getting involved in it was the war with ourselves. Right. There's a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of that. In fact, even when you take it outside of yourself, when you really look right. at all the strategies, you really do have to go back within. Everything starts with your own mind. So strategy is a mental process. And so I have the first part of the book, I call it self-directed warfare. And it's almost a spiritual concept. All of the great religions in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, they all talk about a kind of spiritual warfare with your own human nature. And I talk about there in the first part of the book that you're at war with certain parts of your, of your mind that, that constantly present obstacles. And you could know all of the strategies, you could have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't fight these mental habits, none of it is worth nothing. Oh, I'm telling you, if I didn't have a good medic in my wife, I would never have gotten through half the battles. But right. you're right, they're, they're, they're coming from within. And, and again, I want to shed another light is when you use Sun Tzu's The Art of War, yes. as you say in here, it is true victory is bloodless. There is not even a, a, a battle that needs to be fought. Well, Sun Tzu is, was, a, was a genius. And, that's, and the reason, I mean, his book has stood the test of time, 2,500 years, he's still read to this day. And he has a concept where he defines the art of war, which I believe will never be surpassed. And he says the art of war is basically to win with minimum bloodshed and minimum violence. An army that goes in and mows down the enemy and kills a lot of people and destroys a city simply creates an um, escalating cycles of violence. So the whole game in war is to win with the minimum amount of bloodshed and the minimum amount of violence. And a strategist must try and get as close as possible to that ideal. I think that has incredible relevance and application to any struggle, any fight you're going on in your life. You need to win with the minimum amount of resistance. Now, before we get into the book, I want to say something else about the book. It's one of the very few books that actually says it's a production, and it's a mm. juiced Elfer's book. It's mm. kind of an interesting thing because the structure of the book mm -hmm. is as not as it's the content in this case is way more fascinating, but the structure is beautiful. And I, I want to show people just briefly how sure. this is structured, mm -hmm. because it starts off with the strategy yes. and the historical battle that mm -hmm. reflects it, and they'll be seeing these different images. The interpretation of what that strategy is, the keys to warfare, right. the reversal of the strategy, which is sometimes as interesting as the strategy mm -hmm. itself. You even do an image where you, you write in the text mm -hmm. the way you want someone to visualize mm -hmm. it, and as well as an authority on the subject and 
more support in the red writing. Mm -hmm. It's, by the way, it's like three books, four mm -hmm. books actually, by the, unfortunately right. for me, by right. the time I got through it, it was really reading four books. Right. But each one supports in another way mm -hmm. the theories and the, and mm -hmm. the uh, possibilities that mm -hmm. exist. Well, uh, there's two things to say on that. Um, one of the, my favorite books of all time is actually the I Ching, which is a Chinese book, uh, an oracle book, going back to ancient times, which has a sort of a similar, very I find, a very fun structure that draws you in. The second thing is I always believe, I, I have a chapters in, my, in the power book and in this book, that the structure of something, the way you form it, the, the, the form or structure itself, is actually an incredibly important decision, very strategic in itself. And I'm trying to communicate in different ways. I'm trying to communicate with uh, an image, as you say, with sort of stimulating thoughts from all different directions. So it's all very conscious. Well, you know, what it also does is it, it, it helps people, it, maybe a person is more able to focus on a strategy another person on an image, another right. person on the wisdom of someone. So right. it really allows a person to get fully wrapped around right. uh, the subject, which I like. But I want to, even before I get into the strategies, sure. and we know from last time with the 48 laws, we're never going to get into all that's 33. All right. Is that okay, <laughs> Rob? And the beauty of the show is I get to pick my favorite okay, ones. But beforehand, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the fundamental ideals, right. which you, you, know, you really bring out, and they're as important as the strategies right. themselves. Look at things as they are and don't let emotions color them. Right. I joked before with the 48 laws of power and mm -hmm. how important the number one law is. Mm -hmm. This seems to be very important as well. Well, the thing about warfare, which I think is applicable to life, is the closer you're able to get to reality, to what is really going on in a situation, to what people are doing to you or what is happening around you, the better your strategies will be. And the main block that you have to understanding, to being as close as possible to this reality is yourself, your mind, your emotions. You tend to see what you want to see in the world. Um, your, your feelings of hatred or love or lust or greed, they're constantly coloring what you see in, a, in very subtle ways. And so the process for a strategist is to get rid of as much of that emotions that is coloring your, your viewpoint and getting a, the capacity to see the world for what it is. On the other side, Sun Tzu talks about it, you want to make it harder for your opponents to see reality. You want them to be mistaking things, to, be, to deceive them. But you yourself have to get your mind as close as possible to what is really happening. Well, I want to go a little further then about, about the self because number two is judge people by their actions. I think that was obvious to some extent, but I love the subtlety of this line. It is your own bad strategies, mm -hmm. not the unfair opponent that are to blame for your failures. Yeah. And I think we're very apt to quickly blame someone mm -hmm. when, again, quicker look inside, not to blame yourself, no. but to make yourself aware. Yes, I mean, this is the, the, the liberating part of warfare. When, when it's a very brutal, ruthless arena of war. And when a general loses a war, nobody cares about his good intentions. All they care about are the results. And so I'm saying in life, it's not a question of beating yourself up and saying, why did I do this? Why did I do that? It's a matter of being more realistic. And if you th begin to think of yourself as the master of your own destiny, you're, you're the master strategist commanding your own army, it's actually a very empowering, liberating idea as opposed to something where you just sort of beat yourself down and get down on yourself. It's more the fact that anytime something goes wrong in life, it, you can look at it and say, you were responsible for that in some way. You could have done things differently. Go back, analyze what you did in this mistake you made, whatever, and see, hmm, if I had done A instead of B, it would have turned out differently. And I, you know, I think you can do this for any decisions that you have in life. But I think, again, the key is to not beat yourself no. up on it. And I found that personally, and again, I, I thank you for the 48 laws of power and as mm -hmm. well as, as the guidance in here, that's one of the first things I found that I had to deal with was right. when I would make what seemed like the same mistake again, I would almost feel like punishing myself. Right. And, and that seems to be the one thing you want people to avoid right. when they're even doing battle right. with themselves. A difficult concept, Very but difficult. when I want to, I, I really want to emphasize that. Right. right. Um, I, I mean, your morale, how you feel about yourself is very important. And I, I have chapters in this, how you have to go into battle, and I think 
Life is full of battle all of the time. You can't go into battle with, uh, with negative feelings, a uh, feeling that you don't have confidence. So your own confidence, your own self-esteem has incredible importance in how you end up going to warfare. So the idea is just to be realistic and to learn from your experiences. If you don't learn from your own experiences, then they have no value to you. And so you have to constantly assess, this is what I did in this situation, this was right and this was wrong. And I think it's a very powerful tool. Let's, let's play on a few of them that sure. you, you deal with here. The uh, do not fight the last war right. is the second strategy. Right. And it says that what often weighs you down and brings you misery is the past. Yes. And again, I have a feeling that goes a little bit to what I was saying before is how you're viewing mm -hmm. your past. If you're doing so with this guilt laden and this sort of uh, punishing right. of oneself, that's what you want us to pluck away even right. as we look back at right. our past. Right, exactly, and it's a, it's a delicate game. Um, I think this is one of the most important chapters in the book, and I think it's the, the foundation of any, any good strategist, is your capacity to let go of the past and to not fight the last war. And what that means is the last war will have two effects on you. Either, if it was a defeat, it will bring you down and you'll become more timid and you'll carry that into your next battle and you'll become cautious and worried, and etc. Number two, if it was a victory, you will become elated, you will become drunk on your own success, and you will, you will think, I just have to repeat what I did the last time, which is a great mistake and lots of mistakes in warfare have been because of that. Um, I talk in the book, I say, we all want to get recapture our childhood. We want, but a lot of times we think of that, we want to recapture our, our good looks or that kind of happy feeling we have when we were ch children. I'm saying what you really want to recapture from your childhood is your mind. The fact that you had this very fluid mind that was open to experiences that could take things in for what they were and learn from them and absorb that kind of mental fluidity is the foundation of any great strategist. And oddly enough, the greatest of them all, like Napoleon, Hannibal, they all had this kind of childlike capacity to just simply take what was coming at them and not bring their own preconceptions to what was going on. You know, you use both of them a lot in, in the red margins and in the other, uh, yeah. as well as Churchill. And again, many of the classic uh, war strategists that you apply to our own selves. One right. of them in the counterbalance strategy, which yes. I think is one of the first uh, actual strategies of war was the counterattack, if, mm -hmm. if I remember mm -hmm. in the book. You say presence of mind. Again, mm -hmm. what we go back to, that right. joyous sense of letting the mind be fluid. And I, I, part that I thought, again, if people could really grasp is crowd out feelings of panic by focusing on simple tasks. And one of the people in the book constantly is Churchill. And mm -hmm. uh, a viewer sent me a line, uh, a woman named Peggy sent me a wonderful line where she said, Churchill says, the chain of destiny can only be grasped one link at a time. Hmm. And I, I couldn't help but think of your book as right. I was, was reading through that, as you have to take care of that task. Oftentimes you right. say, even use the simplest task right. that you can knock down and get out of the way, not even the one that may be you mm -hmm. know, pressing on you, but the right. easy one. Well, presence, people often wonder, well, what does war have to do with, with daily life? Well, one of the great concepts in warfare uh, talked about by a, a great philosopher of Karl von Clausewitz, a great um, a person who wrote about war, is this concept of presence in mind. Uh, in, there's nothing more intense, more violent, more stressful than battle or warfare. And presence of mind is simply the capacity of certain commanders throughout history to maintain their mind, to maintain their mental balance and make the right decisions in this ultimately stressful environment. And so what is it that allows them to do this? Well, I analyze it, I show they have this counterbalancing capacity to control their emotions. And I read one instance of a fighter pilot who, uh, I forget who it was, I'm sorry, but, um, and he was facing a, t a terrifying situation in which uh, they was surrounded by enemy fighters and it looked really grim and he was panicking, he was hyperventilating and he found his, the only way to overcome this was to focus on little tasks that he had to do um, you know, buttons he had to press and things like that. And then he was able to sort of calm himself down and make the right decisions. And then he formulated this into a whole philosophy of 
how to maintain your presence of mind in such situations. So I think this, this is one of the ideas that you, know, people can, you can learn a lot from in warfare. You have one that uh, originally sounds like almost cliche, and that's pick your battles carefully. And of course, we've heard that hundreds of times, but here's the right. part that I think separates it. Value what you have, not what you wish you had. I want to repeat right. that. Value what you have, not what you wish you had. And then use that as your strategy. Right. That's it. You can't lose by that, can you? Right. Uh, the concept is that, uh, I titled that the perfect economy strategy, and the idea is that we all have a certain economy. We, have, we only have so much energy, we only have so much time on this planet, and the game is to use this to the maximum. And you can go in one of two directions as a mistake. You can try too much, you can take on too much in your life where the, the task at hand is beyond your capacity, you'll tend to fail, and beat yourself up, or you can take on something that's below your capacity that's so easy and you're not challenging yourself, and that's another form of failure. The game is to have this sort of perfect level where what you're doing in life matches exactly the energy and the resources that you have. And it's the same thing for an army. An army fights best when it is fighting with this sort of perfect economy. Um, so I'm just simply standing, I, I kind of make the analogy of someone who's a swimmer. I happen to swim a lot. When you're swimming right, you're not creating resistance in your path. The water is smooth before you. And that's how it should be in life. You're making the most of, of what you have. You know, you could tell I, I, I enjoy playing this with you, Robert. Turn the tables, number right. nine. And right. again, here's the part that I want to bring out. Never see a situation as hopeless. Your own weakness can become strength with clever manipulation. Now it plays a little bit off of that other one, but now we're even talking about a personal weakness, never looking at whatever the situation is as hopeless, mm -hmm. and then taking that weakness and turning it into a strength. Well, the quote I, ha I have in there from Sun Tzu is about that. I, I love this quote, but the person I used to illustrate it is Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a grand counterattacker. That was his favorite strategy in life. And Napoleon was a very weird character. He actually loved bad situations. He almost had a way of putting himself deliberately in situations that were very adverse, where everything was against him, because his whole mind would rise to the occasion. And his philosophy was, anything negative, anything bad happening to you contains the seeds of a turnaround. You can turn it around into something positive. And you know, this, this could be the fact that your opponent in the battle is suddenly getting a little bit aggressive and carried away and arrogant, you can use their arrogance to turn it around. I think, you know, this is sort of a, a beautiful philosophy in life, if you will. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what the whole book is, is a beautiful <laughs> philosophy of life. Let's play with another one. Mm -hmm. And again, as I say, I think in the back of your mind, I know you're goofing on us sometimes, because I know you like to, you give us that little battle mentality and then we see what is what is mm -hmm. really here, and this one here, maneuver them into weakness. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever happens as expected. If you meet the dynamic situations of life with plans that are rigid, mm -hmm. you are doomed. Right. So keep it simple. And again, right. each one of these plays off of right. the other one. Yes, I mean, um, I, I mentioned earlier about reality and your mind coming closer to reality. Well, the the main thing about reality is it's chaotic. You can't control it. There's the famous concept of the chaos of war. The chaos of war means nothing will happen how you think it will happen according to what you imagine it. And so if your mind is rigid, if you come up with a plan that's just very linear and going, you, you know, you, you, you going from A and B to C and you just know this is where you're going to go, you're going to fail because life or war will come up with things that you don't expect. Once again, the icon in that chapter was Napoleon. I use Napoleon a lot because he was a genius. But Napoleon's genius was in the planning stage. He was a master at organizing and planning. And what he did was he looked at everything of the, si and the situation that was happening. He analyzed everything. He put it on on these note cards, etc. If I did A, how will the enemy respond? If they respond with that, well, I'll do this, this, and this. He and then out of all of this, he would create a plan that was very loose. He would place himself in a position in which he could go this direction, that direction, or whatever the enemy gave him. And this was so 
so brilliant and so novel. And I think this is a model for how we can plan uh, in business and politics, but also in anything that we have to do in life. You know, Robert, I want to uh, give your website out because right. I know you are the person that will respond to people if they yes. want more, and, and this will really be gi give them a chance to do that. It's www.33strategies.com. Of war. Right. I want to make sure we have it right. And it's the number 3-3, three, three, so exactly. I'm going to give it out. It's www. The number 3, the number 3, as in 33, strategies, S T R A T E G I E S, of war.com. Correct. One of the things in there is penetrate their minds. If you want to communicate an important idea, mm -hmm. you must not preach. Mm. Oh, Robert, <laughs> I got to tell you, you're laughing, but, and you met my boys, you know, yeah. they'll tell you. I, I, that's my natural thing, is to go right into that preach, preach mode. mode. Mm. And, and your words are, and, and you know, it's funny, it's my natural thing with my kids, yet I believe the opposite. So I have to just train my own self and mm -hmm. be disciplined because you want the people to uncover and discover mm -hmm. what you want them to discover right. rather than, it's so much more effective. Right. You, you have to think of working with people from the inside out. You want to plant your ideas inside them and so that they, when the, when the idea um, takes seed inside their brain, they think that it was their own idea, but in fact it is you that have put it there. Then it becomes, first of all, they're not resentful. They don't think, oh, this is some, you know, we all have a tendency when someone's preaching at us to, to nod our heads, say yes, 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 but in fact we don't believe a word that they're saying. And it even has the effect of we, we, we're perverse and we want to believe the opposite. The game that you're trying to do is to put the idea in the other person's mind as if it's their own. And then it takes root and then they have no resentment. And it's, it's sort of the ultimate sort of form of control, if you will. I, I talk in the book of Machiavelli, who was a genius at that. The idea is the form of your communication is as important as what you say. Well, you know, as I, I spoke to you earlier, I said when I began following even the 48 Laws of Power, right. which one of them, by the way, hits on something similar oh, yes. to that. Yes. And when I read it again and I said, ah, but with my own children. Right. It was very funny. I had it laid out very well with business, and I right. found with my own kids I was doing the opposite right. until today. All right, boys, <laughs> I know you're in the green room until today. But, you know, it is hard, and here's where I, I want to pick your brain at. Sure. When you're dealing with the passions of life, that's when it would seem like you most need to be remindful of the strategies because that's when they mm. seem to escape a lot easier. Uh, passion has its own pl uh, place in the, in the strategy game. In fact, in my second book, The Art of Seduction, I talk about charisma, which is a very important element in seduction, and a charismatic is a person who feels very deeply about something, and when they communicate it to the world, it's very seductive. And you know, you tend to be caught up and infected by their emotions. So this isn't about becoming some kind of cold, mechanical person who doesn't feel anything. That's not going to influence anybody as well. It's more the fact that sometimes when you're trying to persuade a person, instead of getting caught up in yourself and how you feel about it, you have to think about how the other person is thinking. And you have to think, what are their resistances and, wh and what are their what is their viewpoint? And working from their direction and getting inside their way of looking at it, that's how you have to focus instead of on yourself and what you want to say. And when I'm capable of doing that, right. it does work. It, right. it is noticeably well, that's not different. easy. I'm that's, not what, oh, that's, where, that's where I was going. Right. That's the, it's not, you have to be very mindful. Right. Not to the point of it being obsessive, but almost, it is something. You, mindfulness, I guess that would right. be the right term. It, it's important. Right. Uh, it's more that you're, you're thinking, it's, a, you know, it's strategy. And the point is, you look at another person, I mean, you're wondering, why is this in a book on warfare? Well, I say communication is actually a form of war. You're dealing with another person who has like a wall. They're like a castle, and you're trying to penetrate their defenses. And as we know in anybody who's ever tried to, to, to bring down a castle, you can't just hit at it from the front. You have to try and either go underneath or come to the side. So you're looking at people as something that you have to actually attack and strategize. The whole point is to communicate an idea, you have to be strategic. You just can't just say whatever you want to say and think that your belief will, will convince people. You have to be strategic.
unfortunately, I wish there was a strategy to give me more time, but <laughs> ours is up and I want to end with your words. Events in life mean nothing if you do not reflect on them in a deep way. Thank you, sir, for reflecting on them in a deep way thank you, and sharing Dave. them with us. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Now, before Robert leaves, I would like to leave you with these words from the 33 Strategies of War. True strategy is psychological, a matter of intelligence, not material force. Everything in life can be taken away from you and generally will be at some point. But if your mind is armed with the art of war, there is no power that can take that away from you. I'm Barry Kibrick. It is always a matter of mind. Look closely between the lines, for that is where wisdom lies, and no power can take that away from you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Barry.